Welcome to Signal University. Today we're going to be talking about antennas. The idea here is just to give you a basic class on what antennas are, what they do, and what the different kinds of antennas are. This is not an overly technical engineering course, so some of the concepts have been simplified. Let's answer the question of what an antenna really is. Here you go. Anything that can pull in an electrical signal from the air is an antenna. Generally, antennas are made of metal because metal is really good at doing that. Antennas are used for anything that receives a signal off the air, and that includes satellite dishes. Most people don't think of satellite dishes as being antennas, but they are. Wi-Fi has antennas. Sometimes they're built into the routers so you can't see them. Cell phones, same thing. Oftentimes they're built into the phones, but believe me, they're there. There are broadcast antennas and receive-only antennas. Wi-Fi and cell phone antennas are both broadcast and receive antennas. And TV towers and radio towers are broadcast antennas. For now, we're going to be talking about receive antennas or receive-only antennas. Both terms are accurate. Now, you need a special license in order to broadcast, but you don't need one to receive. You say to yourself, well, I have a cell phone. I have a wireless router, I don't have a license for that. Actually, the equipment is licensed to do it, even though you personally don't need an individual license. Let's look at how an antenna works. All antennas start with a broadcast. If they don't have anything to receive, well, obviously there's nothing that they can do. So we're going to start with a tower. This is a tower. We're going to pretend it's about 35, 40 miles away. A tower is nothing but a big piece of metal. You put enough electricity through it, and it's going to start radiating that power all the way through the air. So let's put a little power into our radio tower. Once we do that, then a broadcast comes from it, and it radiates out in all directions. Eventually, it's going to hit the antenna that's on your home. The problem is that even if you start with a huge amount of power, you'll have a tiny amount of power by the time it gets to your house. You could start with 50,000 watts, and you could end up with one ten-thousandth of a watt. This is called attenuation. When you're trying to measure the power of an antenna, there are three things that are often used. First of all, the frequency range. In other words, what kind of signals will it pick up? Cell phone signals? Wi-Fi? Television? Satellite? That's what's meant by frequency range. Then there's gain. Gain is a measure of how much more signal you can pick up because you're using an antenna. Talk about that in a minute too. And then there's the distance from which it will receive. This is important and I'll explain this in a minute because some kinds of signals can't be received from some distances no matter what you do. Frequency range is probably the most important thing you need to look at when you're thinking about which antenna to use. You wouldn't use a cell phone antenna to try to pick up TV, or a TV antenna to try to pick up Wi-Fi. Now, you'll also see that antennas are shaped differently, and we'll show you a bunch of different shaped antennas. Different shaped antennas and different sizes of antennas work at different frequencies. This is because the frequencies themselves are best captured by different size antennas. When we measure frequency, we talk about kilohertz, that's pretty rare, that's usually only used in AM radio. Megahertz, which is used in cell phone, FM, television, even Wi-Fi. And gigahertz, which are used in satellites. Why different measurements? Well, because, for example, satellite transmissions are up way high in a band that is so, so far away from UHF broadcasting that it just makes more sense to say 14 gigahertz instead of 14,000 megahertz. We also sometimes measure by UHF channel. You'll see an antenna is rated, for example, to run between channels 14 and 69. Then there's gain. Gain is a relative thing. You'll never say to yourself, oh, I'm going to go get myself a pocket full of gain, because it doesn't work like that. Gain means how much more signal can you receive. In other words, if you're sitting there and your TV is not hooked up to an antenna, it's going to get something. Maybe just a little something, but something. If you put up an antenna, 
it's going to get more signal than that. How much more? Gain tells you how much more. We measure gain in decibels. A lot of people are familiar with decibels as being a unit of sound, but actually a decibel is just a unit of intensity. It can be intensity of sound, it can be an intensity of electrical signal, and it can be anything that is measured in intensity. Gain is also a logarithmic measurement, and rather than get into heavy duty detail on that, because that's something that most people aren't familiar with, 3 dB gain means you've got twice as much power. 10 dB gain means you've got 10 times as much power. 20 dB is 100 times, 30 dB is 1,000 times, and so on and so forth. It works this way in negative, too. For example, a negative 3 dB loss is half the power. A 10 dB loss is one-tenth the power. Gain and frequency range work together. What do I mean? Take a look at this plot. You see gain and frequency on two different axes. And an antenna will usually do a certain amount of gain at some frequencies and a higher or lower gain at other frequencies. This is common. Not every antenna is good for everything. And for example, you can see in this particular antenna, it's really good from about 650 to 850 megahertz, which is where UHF channels are, and it drops way, way down below 450 and below 900. Distance is another big factor. As you get further away, just like we showed you in that diagram, the amount of power goes down. And so there is an absolute limit to the distance that you can get. Even if you put in the biggest possible antenna, you could have one of those gigantic dish antennas like they have in those farms in New Mexico, and at some point, you're not going to get anything. The last decade or so, we've had to deal with the difference between analog and digital broadcasting. Analog broadcasting is the kind of old school AM, FM radio, the way the television used to be. And on the other hand, digital lets you fit a lot more information in that same frequency, meaning better quality, high definition television, HD radio, satellite, that sort of thing. But there is a trade off. And here's what I mean with analog, as you get further away, the signal gets down slower and nice and smooth. Eventually you run out of signal altogether, but it's a nice smooth transition. Digital has what we call a cliff effect. At first, you begin to lose signal smoothly. And in fact, digital does really well in close ranges where analog doesn't. But then all of a sudden, it begins to fall off. And very soon you find yourself without any signal at all. People in fringe areas may find that they didn't get as good reception with digital as they did with analog. Even though an antenna is a fairly simple thing, there are a lot of different kinds of antennas. It's important that you be able to understand what they are, what they do, and tell them apart from sight. First, a monopole. This is a monopole antenna. Really, it's just a big metal pole just sticks up from something and it works pretty well to receive stuff in a relatively narrow range. The nice thing about monopoles is they can be collapsed down to take up very small amount of space. That's really the only benefit to them. Cell phones used to use these all the time. In fact, they still do, but you don't see them anymore. They're hidden inside the body of the cell phone. Same thing with AM FM radios. Back when that was considered high tech, you'd always pull the antenna up to focus it. You just don't see AM FM radios out much anymore. Now, the simple dipole antenna. This is what we used to call rabbit ears. Points in two different directions because it's really just two monopoles facing away from each other. It's much more effective than just a simple monopole because of the physics involved. I don't want to get too far into it though. Now, you're going to see a lot of other antennas in the next couple of slides. Believe it or not, they're all basically dipole antennas. This is a loop antenna. A loop antenna is really just a big dipole where it doubles back in on itself. It's also called a coil antenna, and sometimes you'll see a loop antenna will be wrapped around something a little bit thicker 
and that makes it easier to make it the antenna smaller. A loop antenna is good for a wide range of frequencies. You used to see loop antennas a lot with UHF. It was very common because it's good for the wide range of UHF frequencies. However, even though the loop antenna is pretty good at a lot of frequencies, it's not very effective if you wanted, for example, to get a specific frequency. There you would use a plain dipole antenna that was sized exactly for that frequency. Another type of dipole antenna is the bow tie. These are bow tie antennas. The one at the bottom, you can see the bow tie elements visible through the white part of the antenna. And at top, what you see the actual antenna part are the X shapes at the front. Bow tie antennas used to sometimes be called cat's whiskers antennas. Mostly you find older engineers will call them that. Younger folks will call it a bow tie antenna. It's really good for UHF frequencies. Doesn't do terribly well for VHF frequencies. But since most television broadcasting today takes place on UHF frequencies, that's not a problem. Really, it's just a pair of dipoles at different angles. The angles are set specifically to work very well with the frequencies that you're trying to get. The most common outdoor antenna that you're finding is the Yagi antenna. The Yagi antenna, which was not surprisingly invented by somebody named Yagi, is really just a bunch of dipole antennas that are lined up next to each other. You can see that they're different sizes. Each one is tuned to get a specific frequency. They're also designed in such a way, distance-wise, so that one dipole does not interfere with another one. This is the really cool part of a Yagi antenna, is it gives you the benefit of having different dipoles that are tuned for different frequencies, a bunch of them right in a row, so that you can get from all the way from low VHF all the way up to the highest UHF, and it still works. The last type of antenna that we're going to show you today is the dish, also usually called a satellite dish, although it can be used for anything. The difference with a dish is that large parabolic reflector which takes in a lot of signal because it's got a lot of space on it and focuses it all at a point right in the front. This makes it much more effective. The power that comes from satellite dishes because they're 22,000 miles away is very, very low. In other words, it's a very, very weak signal. And so you need to use a large parabolic reflector to collect it and focus it on the antenna at the front. In the case of a satellite dish, that antenna is called an LNB. Now we do often see satellite dish type antennas with satellite TV, but a dish antenna can actually be used with UHF, VHF. It can even be used to help pick up sound. It's very flexible. Now you know the different kinds of antennas, you know a little bit about antennas, and you know how to measure antennas in a very basic way. If you have further questions, visit the Signal Group forums. The address is right up on the screen. Or send us an email over at info at solidsignal.com. Thanks for participating in Signal University. We hope to see you next time.